the last couple of years here at Prophecy in the News, we've been taking you through the book of Revelation. As we would research each chapter and put a commentary on it in our magazine each month, then we would bring it to you by way of our uh, television studio. We have now come to chapter 19 of Revelation. It is the premier chapter of all the Bible. When God wrote Genesis chapter 1, He was pointing us toward Revelation chapter 19. Without this chapter, the Bible would be incomplete. This is the epitome of all theology. This is the climax of all of God's prophecies and promises. This relates the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, as we open the chapter, we are going to see the bride who has made herself ready. Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me the marriage supper of the Lamb. And J.R., you're absolutely right. This is a phenomenal chapter. Uh, we, uh, if it can be said that Revelation is a book based upon the number seven, and there are so many sevens in Revelation, we're coming to the end of the sevens now. Uh, the grand climactic uh, uh, seven of the ages, you might say. Uh, we have here some magnificent hallelujahs. We have uh, the bride who has uh, uh, made herself ready. We have the second coming of Christ with the armies of heaven. In other words, this is the grand conclusion. Absolutely. Let's begin by reading these few verses. We're not going to be able to get the whole chapter here today, but at least we'll be able to give you an introduction to it. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah. The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he saith unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Oh, what a marvelous occasion this is. This is the, uh, the, the time when all of earth and heaven have been waiting for. Hey, Gary, I want you to notice that first there's a group that says hallelujah over the fact that Mystery Babylon is destroyed. Mm -hmm. This group, J.R., uh, in uh, ch chapter 19, verse 1, um, it's a group of many people. Uh, uh, it's a rather large group. Apparently. Yes, but it's not everybody. It's not everybody. Because you see, when you get down here to verse 6, he says, I heard the voice of a great multitude. So here we have much people in verse mm -hmm. 1 and 2, and there we have in verse 6, a great multitude. Now, the much people have to be the victims of this mystery Babylon system. Mm. They must be the martyrs. Like, for example, the souls under the altar, you know, mm -hmm. in, in uh, the earlier part of the fifth seal that is broken. And they're saying, you have avenged our blood. And the, 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 our blood was taken by the great harlot, Mystery Babylon the Great. J.R., this is fascinating because in Revelation 19, 1 through 6, you have four hallelujahs, uh, one of which has an amen associated with it. This is the, yes. a, an amazing pattern that really takes us all the way back to the Psalms. Yes, Psalms 104, 105, and 106 have four hallelujahs and one amen, <laughs> just exactly the way they are yeah, here. That's right. Now, Gary has written an article on the hallelujahs of the Bible. We're going to look at that in our next program, as a matter of fact, so don't miss that program. In it, 
we have noted, Gary has noted, that there are 28 hallelujahs mm. in the Bible. Now, to me, Gary, that, that just sounds like one hallelujah for each of the 24 elders and one hallelujah for each of the four living creatures or the Zoa, the cherubim around the throne of God, total of 28. And of course, we've already stated that, that Revelation is a book of sevens. Four is the number of the kingdom, and if you multiply four times seven, 28, uh, mm -hmm. that number pops up again and again when it comes to the completeness of the kingdom. In fact, Bullinger, E.W. Bullinger, uh, 19th century Christian author, noted that. Yes. In fact, you know, Gary, this vision that John sees is the seventh vision of the book of Revelation, and it's the last one. We have seven visions in heaven, and he has seven visions on earth. Of course, what he sees in heaven is played out on earth, so it's basically the same vision. But he sees a vision in heaven and a vision on earth, and relates them to us in the book of Revelation. And this is the seventh one. Now, we don't really, I think it would be confusing if we went through these seven individually, don't you think? As a matter of fact, they are very complex. Uh, I'm looking here at the September 2003 uh, uh, issue of Prophecy in the News, and JR's complete article in all its uh, details is laid out. And by the way, the details are numerous, but he's made them easy to understand. It's just that on a 30-minute television broadcast, yes. there are too many details. Indeed. I've written, I think it's around 8,000 words <laughs> in this yes. article, so there's no way we could possibly cover it all on this program. But I would like to mention to you, if you'd like to have a copy of this month's uh, program, uh, just call and ask for it. And let me mention to you, too, that it costs a couple of dollars to send this to you. So if you could give an offering would help us stay on the air, we would appreciate it. But you can get the whole thing right here in the September 2003 edition of our magazine. Gary, let's talk about this seventh vision mm -hmm. here. Because to me, the seven it represents a menorah design. We have the seven lamps of the menorah. And the interesting thing is the menorah itself in the seven lamps that it had had a center lamp, that was number four, mm -hmm. and then it had a western lamp that the rabbis have written about, which I think was the seventh lamp. Mm. And both of them shined with the Shekinah glory, they said. Well, Absolutely. That sounds like the first advent and the second advent of Christ. And, and if that's the case, then the, the fourth uh, position uh, would be the fourth millennium, the seventh position, the seventh millennium would work out time-wise as well. Yes. And when you come to the seventh of any of the sevens in the Bible, the seventh one is set apart from the others. Let's take, for example, the seven days of creation. It was six days that God worked, and that's all in chapter one. But mm -hmm. when he comes to the seventh day, God didn't work. He rested. That's different. It's mm -hmm. a set apart from the others. Furthermore, it's put in chapter two of Genesis. It's not in chapter one. So you see the division there between the other six and the final seventh? And that's what we have here in this uh, beautiful picture of the saints in heaven, this seventh vision in heaven, and then we will see him come to earth and fight the battle of Armageddon. That's the seventh vision mm. on earth. You know, it's interesting, and we've uh, spoken of this time and again, but uh, any time you see the number seven in Scripture, uh, you're looking at a menorah design. The seven lamp menorah uh, connects these seven items in a particular way. Uh, each of the arms in the menorah is really half a circle. So the first and the seventh lamp are connected by their arms, and the second and the sixth, and the third and the fifth, and then the fourth stands in the middle all by itself. And this is the way to understand sevens. Yeah. Now, in regard to that, I like the way you said the first and the seventh, because the first vision John has in heaven, mm -hmm. he sees the 24 elders and the four living creatures, and they rejoice in, you know, worthy is the Lamb, and mm -hmm. they fall down before the throne of God. Yeah. This is the seventh vision. And John sees the 24 elders and the four beasts fall down and worship God. They sit on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Mm. Now, these are the, this is the only time in the book of Revelation that you see the 24 elders and the four beasts saying anything. Yes. In the first vision and in the seventh vision. And That's it's interesting, J.R., the first one lays out the need, uh, shall we say, for 
uh, for judgment to take place. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sanctification of that judgment. The seventh one uh, talks about the final sealing of the judgment. In other words, the judgment is complete at that point. In the book of Revelation, there are 17 utterances. Again, we don't have time to go through those 17. But the fascinating thing about that, Gary, is that there are 17 psalms in Psalms 90 to 106, the wilderness psalms that deal with the tribulation period. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a whole lot more, and we'll get to it when we come back in just a moment. On our next program, we're going to deal with all the hallelujahs of the Bible. But briefly, I'd like to deal with the four hallelujahs that we see here in Revelation chapter 19. Gary, the much people, that is the mm -hmm. martyrs, are rejoicing over the destruction of Mystery Babylon, and they say, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, go on and say, salvation and glory and honor and power to the Lord our God, for in righteousness are his judgments. He has judged the great horde which did corrupt the earth, and so on. And then they concluded with the second hallelujah. Yes. And then, of course, the 420 elders, they say, Amen, hallelujah. And finally, the great multitude of all the people in heaven say, oh, Here comes the bride, hallelujah. Now, to me, Gary, that was pre-written in Psalms 104, 105, and 106. Now, I'm not telling you that that's going to happen in 2004. Uh, don't misunderstand me. I'm saying that the four hallelujahs that we have here are preparatory to the great events that we see played out in Revelation chapter 19. Absolutely, and uh, the uh, interconnection between the hallelujahs is absolutely amazing because uh, uh, the, the Jews refers to, refer to these as hallel, that is praise psalms. And these hallel psalms, J.R., look forward to the coming of Messiah. So here in Revelation 19, we actually see the Hallel Psalms uh, 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 voiced by people who are in heaven. Yes. Just to give you an idea of the reason why I'm convinced Psalms 104, 105, and 106 are connected with Re the book of Revelation, listen to the first hallelujah in Psalm 104. It's at the end of the psalm, and this is the final verse. Let the sinners be consumed out of the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, hallelujah. Or in the King James Version, praise ye the Lord. Now, you know, this let the sinners be consumed out of the earth, let the wicked be no more, that's got to be the same thing we see here in chapter 19. Absolutely, no question about it. And, and of course, when that happens, that marks the final degree of preparation for what is to follow, namely the marriage of the Lamb and the second coming. Mm -hmm. And one more, at the very end of Psalm 106, this is at the end of the wilderness Psalms, that is the Numbers book of the Psalms, 90 through 106, it's, it says, save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the heathen, the Gentiles, to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise. Gary, that's Armageddon. It's got to be. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's happening in 2005. It's in Psalm uh, 2006. It's in Psalm 106. I don't know when it's going to happen, but you know we could be very, very close to the launching of the judgment of God, his day of wrath. Well, J.R., that idea of gathering us out of the heathen, of course, that's the nations of the world, the Gentile nations. Uh, to this day, uh, the, the greater number of, of Jews, that is the 12 tribes, is still dispersed throughout the world. They haven't been totally regathered out of the heathen yet, and, uh, and the, the Great Tribulation will finalize that gathering. Mm -hmm. And now we come to the hard part of this chapter. Who is the bride? Mm. I want you to notice here the great multitude, voice of many waters, the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. How come we didn't say we have made ourselves ready? Is there somebody there who's not in the bride? <laughs> Who is this bride anyway? Uh, Gary, that's a that's a question that's 
going to get us in trouble, isn't it? <laughs> That's good. Eventually it will because, JR, this is a very <laughs> tough question. Uh, everyone, I think, when you hear the term bride of Christ, automatically thinks of the church. That's yes. it. Um, the church is a bride of Christ, and of course the epistles of Paul and, uh, make this a certainty. Paul refers to marriage and, and he refers to uh, Christ as the body or the, or the head and the church as the body, and he can, speaks of this divine union. So everyone is familiar with, uh, with Christ and the church being a figure of husband and wife, but J.R., in the Bible, the first such example occurs in the book of Exodus where Jehovah descends in fire to Mount Horeb and institutes a marriage contract with his people Israel. He becomes the husband. They become known thereafter as the wife of Jehovah. Mm -hmm. Now, you need to understand who Jehovah is because, I, you, please understand, Jesus is Jehovah, incarnated in human flesh. He is the same, I, I'm not talking about the twin brother, I'm talking about the man himself. He was the one who came down on Mount Sinai and gave the law. He is the one who came and instituted the end of the law by fulfilling it at Calvary and instituting the covenant of Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant of grace. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the author, Gary. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he's Jehovah. Absolutely. He is Jehovah. His wife, uh, uh, and by the way, that, that, that first marriage contract is what we refer to as the Old Testament. And, yes. and there is a new marriage contract called the New Testament, but J.R., all the prophets, particularly the prophet Jeremiah, speaks of the day when that new covenant will be applied to the hearts of the house of David. Yeah. So if we are both, both the church and the revived house of David are written into that new covenant, then who is uh, mm -hmm. the bride right. of Christ? <laughs> uh, please understand, let's get it settled right now. The bride is made up of the saints. You've got to be a saint to be in the bride. Do mm -hmm. you remember Dives, that rich Jewish fellow who died and went to hell? And he looked across the chasm and saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. Uh, he was not in Abraham's bosom. I mean, he might have been a Jew. He might have been of the house of David. I don't know who he was. Jesus talked about him. But he was not a saint. So first of all, the bride is made up of the saints. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we see 24 elders, which I think everybody would just about agree that that represents the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. So we're looking at the saints of the Old Testament and the New Testament, mm -hmm. but the saints of the Old Testament were not the church. Now, uh, Paul, uh, the apostle Paul, makes it perfectly clear that there is an elect remnant from among the house of David. And that elect remnant, J.R., is going to make it all the way uh, to the last days, and they're going to go into the kingdom. And, and they are going to be saints. They are elect of the beloved. And, and J.R., that means that we have an elect group of saints from the house of David moving right along through the church age. Mm -hmm. And uh, you remember on the day of Pentecost, the high priest holds up two loaves, one for the house of Israel, one for the New Testament church. I'm convinced that's what they represent. But those two loaves that he waves before the Lord on the day of Pentecost are made with leaven. They are not unleavened bread. They are filled with the leaven of sin. And so it shows us that we're all going to get there by grace. We're not going to work our way to heaven. Now, when we get to the holy city, New Jerusalem, we've got gates, we've got foundations. Explain that, Gary. Well, uh, the, uh, the whole holy city of the New Jerusalem is built upon the foundation of the Twelve Apostles. Their names are on its foundation, while the gates have the names of the Twelve Tribes. And J.R., the, the one who laid the foundation is Jesus. And the Apostles then came along and certified His work. Yes. Uh, they were sent out to establish the church. And that temple in heaven, the New Jerusalem, is uh, basically going to rest upon his finished work 
the foundation of the apostles, the gates, 12 tribes, J.R., were all woven together in one temple. They become one in the commonwealth of Israel. Yes. Through Jesus, the husband of, of uh, the Old Testament saints, and the bridegroom of the New Testament saints, and the wife hath made herself ready. Now, what does this mean? Because I think there are going to be people added to the bride during the millennial reign of Christ. When we get over to chapter 20, at the end of the millennium, we see the holy city of New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. Perhaps this is a reference to the holy city. Well, time's up. We'll be back in just a moment.